Hi, I'm Dr. Dave Janda, and please welcome to our Operation Freedom platform, WeThePeopleProcessing.com. You know, are, are you tired of being threatened to be canceled just because you have a company focused on liberty and freedom? Well, worry no more, folks. WeThePeopleProcessing.com is your go-to merchant services, freedom-based company to provide business service payment solutions. We The People Processing provides their clients a cancel culture free platform which is domestically based. They provide competitive rates, no contracts with next day funding, a fully vetted and like-minded financial infrastructure and full support for integrations, implementation and e-commerce efforts. Bottom line, WeThePeopleProcessing.com focuses on defending your company's free market growth, values, and future. Check them out at www.wethepeopleprocessing.com. Once you're on the site, enter in a password Operation Freedom or call 855 499 2024. That's WeThePeopleProcessing.com. Then, when on the website, Enter Operation Freedom as your password or call 855-499-2024. Welcome back to Operation Freedom, folks. I'm Dr. Dave Janda, broadcasting live from our ancillary bunker, Lean Term Mean Freedom Bunker in the People's Republic of Ann Arbor here every Sunday for you from 2 to 5 Eastern, also available 24-7 at DaveJanda.com with extra shows, extra content, extra guests, extra analysis, archives to all of our shows. Stop on by. You will not be disappointed. The information you get, you will never see in the bought-off lame stream fake media. Become part of our freedom family at DaveJanda.com. Since the inception of this radio show back in October of 2010, one of the issues that we have focused on is your financial freedom, your economic freedom. Uh, entities that the syndicate, whatever you, know, whatever you want to call it, the deep state, the new world order crowd, the criminal international banking syndicate, the thugocracy, the deep state, whatever, they're all the same. They focus, laser focus on your financial and economic freedom. Why? Well, because if you're hurting financially, you're an easier target. You're more willing to hand over your freedoms and liberties to the powers that be. And therefore, they get more power control and they actually get more financial resources for them to play with, to strip you of even more freedoms and liberties. That's, that's their playbook in a nutshell. And one of the individuals who has undermined the syndicate's playbook for well over a decade, actually he started his platform about the same time we did on Operation Freedom, is my next guest, Craig Hemke. Craig was a licensed security professional for nearly 20 years. And in his own words, Craig became disgruntled by the fraud known as financial services. And luckily for our country and the world, he retired to career as a serial entrepreneur, and he founded his fantastic platform, tfmetalsreport.com. I go there multiple times every day. Why? Because it is chocked full of information you will not get anywhere else. It is chocked full of analysis you will not get anywhere else. And how can I be confident in saying that? Because it's Craig's analysis which is always in depth, it's always enlightening, and it's about 99% of the time, nothing's 100%, 99% of the time, completely on target and months, if not years, ahead of the curve. Also on that website, he has other people who are involved as his, uh, if you will, his family, and not his, his blood family, but his internet family That that is, in, comprise of incredible people who who also lend their input and their experiences of what's happening in their locales around the world. I encourage you to become a subscriber to his platform, tfmetalsreport.com. You will not be disappointed. It is my honor to welcome back our friend, the 
founder of tfmetalsreport.com, Craig Hemke. Craig, welcome back to the Operation Freedom show and platform. Always nice to visit with you, my old friend. I hope you are well. I'm I'm doing great, uh, much to the Good. chagrin of many people in the syndicate. <laughs> <laughs> the thugocracy, I like that. The, the thugocracy, yeah. So, hey, let's let's talk about Craig about some recent developments, and I want your take. Okay. Uh, first of all, Russia's Gazprom has signed an agreement to start switching payments for gas supplies to China to be paid not in dollars, but in one and rubles instead of those dollars. Then we have BRICS developing a global reserve currency. This according to Vlad Putin. He says, recently stated that the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, are currently working on setting up a new global reserve currency. Now, Craig, am I off by thinking that these two pieces of information are significant to the financial landscape of the world. And particularly the U.S., no doubt about it, yes. Doc. Um, I think you've got a doctor in uh, a Ph.D. in econ as well on this one. You've got it uh, nailed down. That is exactly right. This is something It is a gradual thing, this move away, this offering alternatives to the dollar, uh, I don't think the dollar as a, a reserve currency, and what that means is that dollar is the basis of international trade. Um, I, I, for most everyone's lifetime, the dollar has been the basis of international trade. If country A wants to do business with country B, they transact it in dollars, not in their own currencies. And it creates demand for dollars. I mean, we'd, $30 trillion in debt is basically $30 trillion that are out there. And the system of using the dollar as the basis of trade creates demand for dollars. Well, I think people are probably pretty familiar by now with the current inflation that we have. And I think most folks are aware that that is due to an abundance of dollars. All of, and primarily, all the dollars have been created since, since COVID uh, two and a half years ago. And it's just basic supply and demand. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. I think most folks know that if you have more supply than you have demand, the price of whatever falls. It's like if you grow oranges and there's a bumper crop of oranges, um, usually if the supply is increasing, uh, even if demand holds the same, price goes down. But if supply is increasing and demand falls at the same time, then price really falls. And that's ultimately where this is headed. Uh, the Whatever alternative currency these um, adversarial nations of the U.S. put out there, eventually that decreases demand for dollars at a time when they are continuing to be printed faster and faster with this accumulation of debt. The value of the dollar falls further, and this inflation that we're currently experiencing uh, only gets worse over time. And the creation of this funny money is none other than the Federal Reserve, which was handed over to them in 1913 under the guidance of Woodrow Wilson and the, yep. the syndicate, of which the Federal Reserve is not a part of the executive, legislative, or judicial branches of the United States government, but a group of independent bankers who have wrestled control of our money supply since 1913. And as you mentioned, Craig, uh, print dollars like funny money, if you will, Craig, I want to play this clip. Jerome Powell was interviewed on 60 Minutes. Many people believe what I just said is conspiracy theory. <laughs> right? Conspiracy. That's right. a conspiracy. Well, well, let me play this clip, and then, Craig, you, you are the judge. You are the judge of this financial court about whether what I uttered is conspiracy theory based on our, foot, our first and only witness, Jerome Powell, the head of of the Federal Reserve. Derek, hit it, and then we'll get Craig's take. You simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. We did. Where does it come from? Do you just print it? We print it digitally. So we, you know, we, as a central bank, we have the ability to create money uh, digitally. And we do that by buying treasury bills or, or bonds or other government-guaranteed securities. And that, that actually increases the money supply. We also print actual currency, and we distribute that through the Federal Reserve Banks. 
Craig, your take. Well, uh, it's a moment of honesty by Jerry. Um, this is what I like to call him. Um, but it, it needs to be thought of as kind of an unholy alliance. I mean, you mentioned Disaster Woody. That was what my history professor in college called him, Disaster Woody for Woodrow Wilson. So many things began to go wrong uh, when his presidency uh, started uh, just 110 years ago. But think of it as an unholy alliance between the bankers and the politicians. Uh, the politicians need cash. Uh, they need funding for all of their programs and military programs, social, you know, great society, social welfare programs, all in a, you know, attempt to essentially buy power, buy votes, maintain their power, right? Well, where's that cash come from? Well, they, they, they push through legislation that creates debt. And the debt is what then eventually now gets funded by the Federal Reserve. And so you get this kind of unholy alliance between the two. Federal Reserve uh, and, and their member banks that own them benefit by the greater cash creation because that's, that's really where money is created is at that bank level where somebody deposits cash at the bank and then they can turn around and loan out 90% of it. Um, so, again, think of it as, as this alliance between the two, the financial political complex, if you will. And it is that partnership that has put us into this, and not, not quickly, but gradually, and now into this kind of precarious situation that we find ourselves in. Well, and Craig, we had a celebration at the White House this past week pass, about the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, or as I call it, the Inflation Production Act, right? Uh, there was a, a, a get together, a huge get. James Taylor, I've seen fire and I've seen rain. He was singing on the no lawn of the way, White really? House, South Lawn. Wonderful, wonderful. And <laughs> as all he was singing, he was seeing fire and rain at this huge event put on by Biden to celebrate the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. Well, the data came in and it showed that the U.S. consumer prices were just blowing up, rising for the 27th straight month. There was 8.3% year over year on consumer prices. Over the past 12 months, energy up 24%, food up 11%, just to name a few. But the party was going on. You know, uh, Craig, Craig, uh, meanwhile, the Atlanta Fed was, well, they were slashing the third quarter GDP estimates, again, indicating that we're not just in an inflationary environment, but a stagflationary environment. By the way, something you predicted many months ago and got a lot of grief for. The the uh, Atlanta Fed on September 1st said, well, the third quarter was going to grow 2.6%. Uh, then from uh, then on uh, September 7th, they said, uh, well, 1.4%. And then on September 15th, uh, as the party rolled on, they said eh, actually maybe 0.5%. Now we have Goldman Sachs saying they think it's going to be flat, soon to be negative. Craig, your take. Well, first of all, Doc, if they're going to roll out James Taylor, I'm thinking the whole time they should have brought in Carly Simon to sing You're So Vain, right? That would have probably been even better. Uh, that would, but yeah, then maybe they were not going to do that. But anyway, the, um, should. You're right. It is a stagflationary environment. That is something that, that we've been talking about on my site since June of 2020 is the ultimate outcome of all this. Uh, what I'm waiting for, Doc, is now that, you know, even when I got my economics degree 20 or 30 some odd years ago, uh, it was accepted then that, uh, you know, a basic definition of recession was two negative quarters of GDP in a row. Um, I, when we get the third quarter in a row, are they are the you know the political economists and the politicians going to come out and say no 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 it's only two quarters in a row that it's a recession three quarters is not a recession at all <laughs> that'll be the next that'll be the next lie they try to tell you doc um, it, it, there's no doubt that's where we are it gets you know again why does this persist well a number of reasons but at the core of it all is what we were just discussing about ten minutes ago you have too many dollars chasing too few of goods. And that's when prices rise, and that creates uh, all sorts of problems across the board. Um, margin pressures at companies that then if they can't pass along those higher prices, then they've got to maybe start laying people off at a time when 
Jerry Powell says he wants to cause pain. It's just unfortunate we're going to cause some pain to people. Um, it's, it's really a remarkable world that we live in. I, I think of two other things, Doc. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you and I are old enough to remember Alexander Solzhenitsyn, right? Yes. The old um, um, the dissident, if you will, in the Soviet Union. Um, I guess yeah, where he fits in here is he was a dissident of the dying empire of the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s. So if you take his words and compare it to the dying empire of the United States at this point, what it, what, here's a quote from him. We know they are lying. They know they are lying. They know that we know they are lying. We know that they know we know they are lying, but they persist in lying. Mm-hmm. That's uh, pretty much where we are. Words mean, mean nothing at this point, Doc. You know that. Uh, as long as the spin continues to, you know, to keep the party going on as long as possible. Um, this is getting to where it's um, a, a, really a precarious situation. I really, even right now this week, uh, people with investments, whether it's in the stock market through their 401k or whatever, need to really be paying attention. Uh, Powell and his buddies have been talking about inflicting losses on uh, stock market investors since April, and uh, they may be getting real close and the, uh, to really pulling that off. I, there's a, I don't know, about one chance in three at this point that the s and is on the verge of about a 30% drop from here. And that would obviously have quite a negative impact on, um, you know, anybody that's a retiree or a pre-retiree. Uh, this is a time to be pretty cautious. Um, you know, the old adage is don't fight the Fed, right, Doc? And if they're telling you they want to inflict losses, well, mm-hmm. you might want to be paying attention. So, Craig, to all those people that say, wait, the last time we were in a, a, a stagflationary environment, although this could well be worse than back then, we're in the late 70s, early 80s, and gold and silver did pretty well during those. Mm-hmm. Um, many people are frustrated currently that follow, operative word, the paper prices of gold and silver as opposed to the physical prices of gold and silver. Uh Address those folks, Chris, uh, uh, Craig, that that are that follow the precious metals and are frustrated right now. Well, I I think the if I if I just pick one point of that to explain to people, again, think of um, what determines the price is the trading of futures contracts. When you see a price going across the screen on CNBC or Bloomberg or whatever, that is the price of the of the futures contract, not. It's not we're not trading physical metal here. We're trading these derivatives. Well, okay. Like anything else, what determines that price is the supply and the demand of that futures contract. And right now, uh, no one is buying it. In fact, there are a lot of sellers that are selling it, and that's why price is going down. And the main thing, and again, remember how much of this is done by computer, probably eighty to ninety percent on a daily basis. Uh, a daily basis of the trading volume of these futures contracts is done by computer. I mean, not like you and I entering trades through the computer, pre-programmed uh, algorithms that see changes in one market and changes in another and then act to buy or sell in a third market. Okay. So you got it again in determining this price and what drives it up and down, you got to get to, okay, well, what's affecting supply and demand and what makes the demand from these computers to, to buy gold futures. And the primary thing, and it has been this way now for 15 or 20 years, is what's called real interest rates. Not inflation as a standalone number, not CPI at 8%, that sort of thing. It is your inflation-adjusted interest rates so that you can look at gold compared to, say, the 10-year Treasury note. It is those inflation-adjusted interest rates that drives price. And so that's where you get this mis, you know, kind of misguided, uh, misperception, whatever the right term is, that people say, well, gold's no longer hedge against inflation. Well, it is uh, over the long haul. But in the short term, you know, in periods like this, what's really driving gold is inflation expectations and regular nominal interest rates. And until that changes, we're probably stuck here in the mud for a while, but it will change <laughs> because, Doc, you know as well as I do, 
I mean, the Fed's not just going to like never buy any more bonds, and they're never, you know, never going to print any more cash because if they do, the whole thing just I mean, collapses on itself like a house of cards. So it's just a matter of time before the Fed turns on the printers again, and it's just a matter of time before they have to step into the bond market and drive rates back down. And when they do, inflation expectations will soar and interest rates will go down, and those real interest rates, like I was just saying, will be sharply negative again, and the computers will be buying gold again. So that's how it works. In the meantime, yeah, I know it's extraordinarily frustrating. God, i got to write and talk about this every day. I'm not sure how I do it. But I guess I'm safe in the knowledge of where this is all headed, and that's what at least keeps me in the game. Craig, might this be of uh, significance? This came out this past week. Why China may soon reveal astounding gold reserves. This is from Henry Chia. Uh, an intriguing pattern of price moves in global gold markets has cleared the way for China to hoard an enormous amount of the precious metals, according to a veteran analyst and trader, Francis Hunt, who says that China may soon reveal astounding gold reserves. Craig, um, am I reading too much into the potential significance of that? If that occurs, no, no, Doc. It goes back, and again, this goes back to your first question as well uh, about uh, a, a challenge to dollar supremacy. And I'll get there in a second. One, nobody has any idea how much gold China officially has. Or what are they? Uh, they try to claim they've got fifteen hundred tons or something like that, but they've got all this mineral wealth. You know, you know how much the Chinese citizens hoard gold, uh, and, the do- and and as net exporters. And all their foreign currency reserves, the Chinese could easily have been building uh, tonnage level reserves of gold over the last 30 or 40 years. So no one really knows how much. We, all we know is they don't just only have 1,500 tons like they officially try to say they have. The significance of all this gets back to what we talked about earlier and then uh, challenging the dollar for reserve currency status. And a, a, just a quick history lesson, the reason the dollar is the world's reserve currency is because after World War II, the global economy was decimated and all, the global, all these different countries were decimated and nobody had any wealth, really, that they could back a, a, a currency with. And you've got to back your currency with something just so that you have confidence in the stability of the value of it. Because and that's where you get into hyperinflation, Doc, right? Like Weimar Germany, where... I, you might want to, uh, I might sell you my, whatever my, you know, a bushel of corn or something for $5. But if I think uh, the, what I'm getting back from you, these $5 are going to be worthless by half tomorrow, well, then I'm going to demand seven fifty instead. And, you know, that's where the hyperinflation comes from, because you don't have confidence in the stability of the value of that currency you're transacting. And that's why coming out of World War II, they backed the U.S. dollar with gold to give it stability. U.S. had about 25,000 metric tons at the time. Uh, we now have about 8,000, allegedly. But it was that backing it with gold that gives it the stability and thus then uh, to use it as a unit of, of currency and thus to be, because you've got to have something with confidence. And that's where this heads back to the beginning, what we started talking about at the bottom of the hour. If you're going to eventually offer some type of alternative to the dollar, you might want to back it with something to make it preferable to the mm-hmm. dollar, which is backed by nothing. So if you can come up with some regional currency, uh, the Russians, the Chinese, the India, you know, these BRICS nations, and back it with the Chinese gold reserves that are maybe 25 times what were stated, well, then all of a sudden you've got something. You've got something that all that developing world would like to use as, uh, as a measure of, you know, a means of transacting trade uh, as opposed to the dollar. And again, this gets back to then less demand for dollars at a time supply is growing, which means your value of dollars is going to go less. And it doesn't matter how many times the Fed rate hikes, uh, you're going to just get worse and worse inflation over the years. Craig, in our last minute, educate our listeners on tfmetalsreport.com. It is your lifeboat in a storm, my friend, and you know that. Uh, Twelve years now, uh, we talk about gold, but we talk about the world and, and global economy and macro and I mean everything. <laughs> 